Welcome everyone, and welcome one and all. Today we have a special kind of video for you all. I'm Casey, also known as the co-founder of GTA Gaming, a GTA fan site started by myself and my friend Kyle back in 2001, 2002 roughly. So I've been a GTA fan since I was like a fetus. This video is a one-of-a-kind production, mainly written by Jan2295 and edited by GTA Series Videos. In this video, we want to talk to you about the ever-evolving modding scene of the Grand Theft Auto series from its very beginning to the latest troublesome events that have risen lately. As always, thanks are in order to AAP, Ash735, CP, Boywand, Dekluin, Nihilist, Sergi, Silent, The NG Clan, Wildbrick142, Zinurki, Zolio1351, and all the modders out there who have spent their time and their abilities into making possible something that had seemed impossible. Modifying single-player games has been around for as long as PC games have, and mods have arguably become an increasingly important factor in the commercial success of some games like Doom, the very first game to have a large modding community. Mods add a depth to the original work made by the developers and can be both useful to players and a mean of self-expression and discovery. Mods for me are a form of personal expression. You can change the inner workings of a game you enjoy, personalizing the entire experience there's really nothing else quite like it. Plus, you get to learn how some super cool games work. I think there's an innate human desire to create and help other people, and modding fulfills that perfectly. Creating a new car, adding a new feature, fixing a bug, it all comes down to one thing, creation. When I look at the download count of one of my mods, that's not just a number. Those are all actual people who enjoy something I have created. Mods have even been the starting point of what later became games on their own, like Counter-Strike, Dota 2, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, and many, many more. The GTA series is no exception. Modding started with the very first 2D titles, with simple modifications changing the in-game vehicle's textures or adding an additional language. GTA is not Half-Life nor The Witcher, but thanks to its notoriety, it does count thousands of mods available for each title in the series. Modding has been accepted and welcomed by DMA Design first and Rockstar Games later, with the developers even giving a hand to the modders to create tools and better identify problems and script in order to add or change something in the game. But this liaison started to crack in 2005 after the hot coffee controversy. Discovered and named Hot Coffee Mod by Patrick Wildenborg, also known as Patrick W., this modification gave access to a minigame that was completely disabled in the final version of San Andreas, in which players were allowed as protagonist Carl C.J. Johnson to have animated sexual intercourse with an in-game girlfriend of their choosing. After a first attempt at defense by Rockstar focused on blaming the modder, attempt even criticized by Hauser himself, Rockstar released a patch for the original version to disable access to the minigame. It was a pretty big deal at the time. I remember getting an email from Rockstar Games themselves asking us to remove any mention or the mod itself from our site, which we did because we wanted to stand good terms with them and we didn't want to get in trouble. From that point onward, we didn't really hear much from Rockstar up until there was a GTA 4 event. So this was a good few years later until we really started to connect with Rockstar again after this whole thing happened. The hot coffee incident was one of the original turning points where Rockstar games threw modders under the bus. For a while after, it felt like the relationship between Rockstar and the modding community was at odds. But they never made things difficult for the community, and by the time of Grand Theft Auto 4, they even laughed at the event themselves followed by them posting about mods and such on their own newswire. After the class action suit against Rockstar Games for the part they played in the infamous hot coffee scandal had finally been resolved, granting all US citizens who were offended by the event up to $35, Rockstar connection with the modding world had definitely changed. While they still approved the work made by the modders and even promoted it from time to time on their website, devs were no longer allowed to give help or information that involved the alteration of in-game files. From that moment up until mid-2017, nothing really changed. Take-Two, on more than one occasion, made headlines by shutting down huge modding projects, for example, the first Red Dead Redemption into GTA V, or hunting down a dev kit containing beta details about their latest title and more. But hell had yet to break loose. Yeah, gotta go now. On June 14th, 2017, a bombshell hit the GTA modding community. Open 4, 
A file explorer and editor for GTA 4, GTA 5, and Max Payne 3, an essential tool in modding, was being shut down due to a legal notice from Take-Two. The claim stated that Open 4 allowed third parties to defeat security features of its software and modify that software in violation of Take-Two's rights. A few days later, Rockstar Games released an official statement explaining that Take-Two's actions were not specifically targeting single-player mods, but that unfortunately Open 4 enabled malicious mods that allowed harassment of players and interfere with the GTA Online experience for everybody. They even reiterate their support to the creative modding community by affirming that actions were taken to assure that the modding community could keep living. The community didn't fully accept Rockstar's apology because of the flaw in their statement. Open 4 had nothing to do with GTA Online, and it could only be used to modify the single-player experience. A few days passed before Take-Two went back on their decision and decided to allow Open 4 to be distributed again, with Rockstar Games publishing an agreement listing what was tolerated and what was not. To summarize, Take-Two would not allow content from the 3D-era GTA games or from non-Rockstar games to be ported to Rockstar titles published after 2007, and wouldn't allow mods affecting the online games such as GTA Online and Red Dead Online. For once, the whole community came together in support of Open 4 as one big voice that has put Take-Two in the position to have to listen to GTA fans. While I do not always agree with massive bandwagons and review brigading, for once, I feel like this was completely justified because through harsh action, we've gotten contact and agreement. We were no longer ignored or silenced. We've been heard. It simply had to be done in order to protect our community and modding as a whole. More happened from that date on. But in July 2021, another bombshell was dropped by Take-Two onto the GTA modding community. As reported by Ash735, Take-Two sent several DMCA takedown notices to popular mod hosting websites such as GTA 5 mods and ModDB in regards to several older GTA mods, mainly porting and total conversions. We're talking projects like GTA Underground, a 15-year-old GTA San Andreas mod, combining the maps of San Andreas, Liberty City, Vice City, maps from Bully, and both Manhunt games into one gigantic map. Another mod hit was GTA LC, a total conversion modification porting the entirety of GTA 3 into GTA Vice City, and GTA State of Liberty, another GTA Vice City modification adding features from GTA San Andreas and GTA 3 into an enhanced version of Vice City. More DMCA takedown notices have been served to various mods and hosting websites in August, with other total conversions being shut down, like Open Manhunt, a GTA San Andreas project who brought all the various stages of both Manhunt games into San Andreas. So, while it's understandable under the new EULA, but still debatable why certain projects have been taken down, none of these previously mentioned mods were breaking the new rules imposed by Rockstar Games and Take-Two in 2017. Or at least, that is what it looked like. The community found out that the previously discussed agreement has been modified again in 2019, with a new line specifying that on top of not allowing modders to port content from other games, they are now not allowed to create new content either for any other games. So in other words, if before it wasn't allowed to port stuff from the 3D era to the Rage era and vice versa, now is simply not allowed to port content from any game into a different one, period. But that's not all. According to the new rules that have been sneakily edited in back in 2019, borrowing assets from other IPs or making new games, stories, missions, or maps is no longer allowed, meaning that all original projects like GTA The 95 Story or Tiki Island are done, kaput, despite them being original content made for one single game without importing anything from a different IP. So in simpler words, according to this new agreement, modding is no longer allowed, period. For now, Rockstar Games have remained silent on the matter, but in a recent investor call, Take-Two was asked by an investor why they started removing old Grand Theft Auto mods through some DMCA takedown requests. This is Strauss Zelnick's response. Um, in, in terms of takedowns, we're pretty um, flexible, frankly. Uh, that said, if the economy is threatened um, or if uh, if there's bad behavior, and we, we know how to define that, then we would, we would issue a takedown notice. 
bad behavior aside, which would be nice to understand how Take-Two defines it in order to understand the actual limits of what is allowed and what is not, it's clear that their main reason is monetary. Now, it's plausible to think that Take-Two are taking down those mods in preparation for the announcement and release of a GTA Trilogy remaster, a new release of GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas in a different suit and for new platforms. As some people pointed out, this all happened only a few short days before the release of a massive GTA Online update long awaited by the community. It almost looks like Take-Two timed these DMCA notices in a way that distracts, putting fansite focus on the new GTA Online updates and away from the DMCA takedown notices. It's without surprise that these events once again cause a massive uproar in the GTA community, with many modders deciding to pull the plug on their projects and retire, as well as leaving many wondering what's next for the future of modding. Here's what some of the most prolific and known modders from the community have to say on this matter. If they're going to keep going this route, GTA modding will probably be extinct, and that's absurd. GTA and modding go hand in hand pretty much since the beginning of this franchise, beloved by many. It simply can't be allowed to happen. I'm heartbroken seeing so many super talented people I know personally, some of them I'm grateful to call friends, being disenfranchised by a faceless corporate bully. I personally find it simply despicable to wage a war against the very people who dedicate their time and effort to make your games only bigger and better, who ensure they don't die out, who never ask for anything in return, and who ultimately promote your products for free. I think Take-Two's actions are entirely misguided and unnecessary. Whoever thinks that mods are a threat to official products is wrong, as none of the creations they took down attempted to misguide people into believing their official entries of the franchise. I think these actions will do more harm than good, as modding always was, and hopefully still will be, a major driving force for a lot of people interested in GTA. Modding is a gray area because, yes, it's written in the agreement that reverse engineering, changing, distributing files, etc. is forbidden, but it's a contract where specific rules are enforced or not depending on whoever at Take-Two is in charge on that day. But going for the nuke option just doesn't make sense. It's madness when you think about it and comes across as a total power play. I believe there are many shades to this situation. On one hand, it's just a company trying to harness control over and protect the use of their intellectual property. But at the same time, we're merely fans doing this out of love and fondness for these games. To me, as long as it doesn't leave Take-Two out of pocket or damage their franchise's reputation, I see all of their measures as overstepping rational protection limits. There is no doubt that the modding community has helped the GTA franchise over the years by breathing new life into the 2D, 3D, and HD era GTA games. As said by Ash735, in terms of the 3D era GTA games, mods are essential to play those games properly. Mods like Silent Patch, Sky GFX, G Input, and Widescreen Fix are the minimum requirements now because of how broken these old ports are on modern systems. Modding has even brought new people to this franchise thanks to entirely new creations and new features that the games didn't originally have. Single-player games are kind of eternal as they don't require servers, as said by Zolico1351. Most of the time, modding is absolutely required to keep the games playable and up to standards, and add replayability with new features. As pointed out by Nihilist, modding has been even something that Rockstar looked at to develop new things in their games, like GTA 4's editor, which was a reaction to the popularity of GTA San Andreas' machinima videos. Modding is not just a texture or a line of code. Modding is half my life. I met a lot of people, shared my knowledge with others. Modding also led me into improving my skills while working in a team of talented, great people. I feel like it helped me be more confident and useful. Take-Two basically closes off ways for many new potential creators for whom modding could spark a new interest or a lifetime goal. Lots of talent could go to waste because of this. Modding is not just about a bunch of enthusiasts tinkering with their favorite games. There have been examples of modding making careers or branching off to separate commercial games, and I think that's another important aspect of it. By doubling down on modding, a wide range of potential future game developers may just get discouraged. Modding really just represents love towards the GTA franchise in more ways than one. It's dedication to an absurd level to treat these games with so much respect and importance that people feel the need to improve upon them. It's either that or the fact that it's often a cheap and easy way to create something and let your imagination run wild. Much easier compared to actual game development. All in all, modding is either a love letter to the franchise we've grown up with, or an amazing outlet for young wannabe game designers to test the waters early on. 
It goes without saying that the intent of a mod is not to hurt the game, but to expand on it, to make it more accessible, to make it more appealing. A mod could even help the sales of a game by drawing more people to it. Mods very much improve single-player games. Developers do not have the time and resources to include every single little thing that anybody might want. It's a very unrealistic expectation. Thus, modding helps to fill that gap. You have DYOM to add more stories to GTA SA, or the Vanilla Works community adding cars that would otherwise never be added, or the remastered map mods for any game giving you more places to play on. There's something for everyone, and even if there isn't, nothing's stopping you or anyone from making it a reality. Modders can make their own bug fixes that greatly improve the game quality, such as the most famous Silent Patch. There's absolutely nothing hurting single-player games. Mods, as long as they aren't things designed to harm multiplayer environments, should be accepted for what they are. Free passion projects that are made by fans for fans. It's an effort to understand said games while also breathing new life into them for years to come. And quite frankly, the gaming industry owes a lot to the eccentric software engineers that have worked on mods for so many years. The one question no one can answer is what does the future hold for the GTA modding scene? The rules have been changed, and surely the clear step made by Rockstar Games from single-player open-world developer into games-as-a-service developer will not help the modding community. While it can be argued that the sole owner of the GTA franchise, and therefore rulemaker, is Take-Two Interactive, we do hope that they can start looking at modding the way we do, without solely focusing on anonymous data that does not help being in touch with those who are probably some of their most dedicated fans, and have been for many, many years. And that's all for this video. We want to thank again all the modders interviewed by Jan2295 and all the hundreds of creators releasing modifications every single day. And we sincerely hope the best possible outcome. This video has been a community project and we do hope you enjoyed it. Keep following GTA series videos on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or jump in the Discord server with thousands of other fans of Rockstar Games. This has been Casey, and I thank you for watching.